Hello and welcome to the weekend podcast of Lotus Heaters. I'm here with Josh and Hello. we'll be talking about Marx and his view on the individual and how accurate that is or not. So, exactly. So this is going to be a two-part two part series indeed. as well, uh, today and tomorrow. And today we're going to be talking about the first part. Well, we're going to talk about how Marx's views uh, kind of of their time and also we're going to compare them to kind of his contemporaries and kind of show that there were already modern ideas in circulation that we accept to this day that Marx rejected and we're going to kind of be looking at where he's right, where he's wrong, because okay. I, I do think there are some actual benefits to his interpretation of the world. Like it's not you, just because of the awful things that have happened because of some of his ideas doesn't mean that you need to discredit all of them. And right. I think they're worth talking about. Right. But also, I, I do want to talk about some of the more dangerous ones and why I think they're wrong and why they're dangerous. So the kind of ideological overview will be what what's going to what we're going to talk about today and and so what what are we going to leave for tomorrow okay so to today i'm i'm going to talk about the kind of ideological overview yeah. as you said and also i'm going to talk about marx's view on human nature and how he rejects the idea that humans are naturally selfish which i disagree with and i'm going to talk about why and then in the second part i'm going to talk about human motivation and how it, marx believed that Individuals in history are not as important as kind of the circumstantial factors. So history has a, a driving force that no one individual has total influence over. And also I'm going to talk about the limitations on the individual, mm -hmm. which is things like uh, ways that an individual may not or can be free, essentially. Okay, okay. So uh, so let's let's start with the first part then. Sure. Um, I, actually, I would like to talk about why I actually wanted to cover this. Okay. Um, so I believe that our view of politics is predicated on a model of the individual, like our understanding of the individual and how they act is how we establish our political beliefs, I, I think, at least that's my case. I can't speak for everyone, but I think at least some relation to that is important. I, how do you kind of feel about it? So, so do you feel that that that's important in the way not 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 to just inform our own thinking about ourselves in society, but also the political system or the political implications of it? Yeah, like um, if there are policies that run counter to human nature, they're going to cause more problems than they're going to solve, essentially. And I've. And okay, not, I, I, would, uh, I would imagine that a lot of people would be protesting right now against uh, against there being such a thing as human nature. So, are we going well, to... there, there certainly is. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's not necessarily that we have to uh, construct legislation to kind of placate human nature necessarily. Mm -hmm. Some some things we need to mitigate against. Like uh, I could give the example of if someone steals from you and then you kill them, and then you find where their family live and kill them as well. That's obviously awful. And that is something like being violent towards people that do things to you is kind of part of human nature. I don't think anyone would necessarily dispute that, but it's not necessarily something that is good. And natural is not synonymous with good okay. in just to clarify. Yeah, <laughs> no, that, that's, a, that's a good kind of way to put it, that even because it's often assumed, right, when someone asserts that something is natural, that, that automatically yeah. means means good. Especially in, in when it comes to, like, but... food. Like, natural <laughs> is, like, the be-all and end-all. Like, right, yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to human nature, it, it's less beneficial, I suppose. So just the fact that something is common to our uh, our kind of inner being doesn't mean that that's how, how society should be organised, I think. Like exactly, that. yeah. Right. I, I, I do believe that because we are conscious, we can overcome our inherent nature, which is what makes human beings unique from animals. Right. So um, I, I think you said you said that we'll we'll get into that based on some of the studies that, that you have in there. Absolutely. There, okay. are, there are many ways in which we are not different from animals. And <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're quite funny in how much they represent it, but I, I won't spoil anything because it, it is quite amusing. But anyway, to get into... Marx's actual ideas, um, we should look at kind of the political ideas circulating in the 19th century when Marx was about. 
So in the 19th century, liberals were already considering the development of the individual as the most important thing, which is something that I think we are very supportive of here. Um, <laughs> and the term individual and individualism was strongly associated with liberalism at the time. So even the notion of the individual had some degree of political connotations at the time. And liberals seem to point out that all we needed were good laws and any laws or customs which could not be rationalised as promoting public good or social welfare, however you want to define it, um, should be kind of scrapped. And we, we want to be promoting the welfare of citizens, however that may be. And although liberals may not have agreed what welfare meant, it, it was the basic framework in which they all operated under. And in Germany, they kind of rejected this idea, <laughs> which <laughs> all, all ominous things seem to start with. Um, so there was the jurist and legal historian Friedrich Karl von Savigny. I'm probably butchering how that's pronounced, but there was, there was this person who believed that laws could not be written by men. Laws were derived by the soul of the whole unit which is a mean? bizarre... So I, I, essentially, I thought, I, I only thought... laws can only be contrived by a collective. The individual, right. like individuals are only a mouthpiece for the collective will is what essentially they believed. So, so when, when you started saying that, I thought you were going to go on to say God or something like that. It just, it, it's, it's not, yeah, it's not it's... <laughs> it's derived by God, soul of the collective, soul of the whole. Yeah, that, so... That sounds very... He would say, it is not an individual that thinks, it is the nation or the social body that merely uses an individual as a means of expressing the collective's thoughts. That's what he believed, and this idea was very popular in Germany at the time. And there are also other Germans, uh, the uh, anthropologist and philosopher Ludwig, Ludwig, Ludwig <laughs> Feuerbach, F E U E R B A C H. That's I'm okay. painfully That's okay. That's okay. Uh, poor at any foreign languages. <laughs> so I apologize to any Germans that are watching. Um, he believed that both nature of each human and humanity as the whole um, were the same thing. Okay. So the individual did not differ from the collective, essentially, which was where Marx more heavily derived his interpretation right. because, of course, anthropology and sociology, they're mm -hmm. kind of closely knit disciplines, aren't they? And, and so so when when these people would have this kind of idea of the collective and the individual, would they recognize that an individual can have different thoughts and different kind of ideas than the collective? Uh, or Because you, you said that the individual can only be a mouthpiece for the collective uh, yeah. in that view. Uh, is that... Can can the individual differ from the collective in some ways, or is, and and then is the kind of is only the collection of the individuals kind of if you average them out like what what makes up the collective or is well the other that's, way that's the problem with the the ideas they 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 didn't really feel the need to define or elaborate on it and the the exceptions to the rule where people believe things differently to perhaps a number of people were kind of overlooked as almost anomalies, I imagine. Okay. So it's it's a very limited view of the individual I that, see. that kind of is the basis for and the environment in which Marx developed his theory of the individual. Right. So so that that's the background to Marx. And so what about yeah. Marx himself? So it's kind of my opinion that Marx is he kind of has an impression of what human beings are like that seems to kind of relate to human nature, but he gets a lot of important distinctions wrong. And that there are some things that he does get more right than wrong, and there are lots of things that he gets more wrong than right. But I think in breaking them down into different subjects, we can evaluate each of his claims kind of by its merits rather than tarring his entire model of the individual as wrong. Okay. But I would say it's more wrong than right. So let's do it claim by claim then. Sure. So I'm going to start with Marx's view on human selfishness. Um, so it was already kind of proposed that human beings were naturally selfish mm -hmm. um, by people like Kant and Hobbes. And Kant and Hobbes believed respectively that 
This could be mitigated against by being rational, which was Kant, and through the state, which was Hobbes. And I'm more aligned with the Kantian view that through be being rational, you don't necessarily have to behave selfishly and in a kind of baser manner, if that makes sense. <laughs> right. So, so through rationality, you can overcome yeah, the selfishness. Because rationality is a product of consciousness and consciousness allows us to overcome our nature or at least I believe. So it, it seems like a quite intuitive idea to me and quite advanced for the time that human beings could mitigate against their nature just simply through thought. And I believe that is the case. And so, so what about someone like the Stoics then who would, who would say that it's in your nature to be rational and that's you fulfilling your true nature? Well, any economist could disprove that <laughs> because but human beings do as, not... as in as in using your reason to you know, kind of lead your life rather than your impulses well human beings simply just don't behave that way <laughs> people people operate on their impulses uh far more often than they don't and this actually ties into something i know quite a bit about which is dual process theory which is a behavioral decision decision making theory which poses that the human brain has two different neural systems um you might have come across it in thinking fast thinking slow by right. kahneman and tversky probably butchering that as well um but essentially they say that you have a slow deliberate conscious process that's more rational and you have a quick heuristic or rule-based system mm -hmm. which comes to snap decisions and the kind of evolutionary rationale is that um, the quick decisions allow us to avoid life or death situations. So you walking down a dark alleyway might seem a bit ominous, even though there's nothing there. But that's because you've got kind of heuristics that avoid potentially dangerous situations. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's much more important to avoid danger in that situation rather to be exact. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So they're not they're kind of blunt instruments to keep a being alive, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And that is kind of the the entire basis of human decision making, according to them, and something that I certainly subscribe to. Although I think it's a little bit more complex than that. Right. Okay. But I'm not going to get into that. That's <laughs> I could go on for hours about that because I've I've done research into it, and <laughs> I won't bore you all with it. And yeah, so sorry that I'm um, provoking you to go into rabbit holes. <laughs> it's <laughs> all right. To go into. So let's, let's, get, let's get back to Mar uh, Of Marx course. Then. So Marx thought that a good society was one which allows our nature's full expression. So obviously he did not believe that human beings were selfish because generally speaking, being selfish is not a good thing or being prosocial. It is kind of perceived as the more... It's the, the thing that we want to encourage, essentially, although some degree of self-interest is obviously important. We don't want it to go to too far an extreme. It's it's the thing that is seeing as, as the desirable one. Yeah. Yep. And he believed that people behaved selfishly in his own time because it was a product of scarcity and capitalism and it is not an immutable human trait, mm -hmm. essentially. So he believed that capitalism taught people to be selfish because there was a finite number of resources and therefore they had to behave in their self-interest. So if scarcity ceased, then human beings would also cease to be selfish, okay. which is definitely a product of its time because obviously in modernity, there's not really any scarcity of, you know, food, water, at least in the West. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, yeah, but uh, then you could say, okay, people are being people might be uh, might be playing devil's advocate but uh that people might be less selfish today about things like food and be more kind of altruistic about about these things that are in abundance sure uh, and and more kind of apprehensive of of those things that are that are still kind of scarce scarce or yeah, so subject to much more scarcity than to, than, to example, put it food. in economic terms people would be uh, more selfish with consumer goods because those are the things that in a modern society are perceived as supposedly scarce, whereas, you know, food, water, although there are certainly a small minority of people that might struggle for those in a Western society, it's largely an, a human need that is satisfied. 
Would you say that's fair? Um, yeah, yeah, I would. I would say I, I'm not sure whether whether um, whether consumer good and like even if it, and distinction between consumer good and and food is not like I, I I'm, I'm not I'm not sure that that's uh, that's particularly okay. I, I'm not sure about 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 that one, but uh, I, sure. I understand what you, what you're saying is mm-hmm. that that you you have some things in which obviously you can you can observe people being selfish about, and those are the ones that are still still are more scarce, but. Isn't that something that would kind of validate on this point what Marx was was thinking? Well, uh, I think that there's there's not necessarily any reason to suggest that scarcity is anything to do with human nature. Like, it, I know that's a weird thing to say, but I don't think human nature will necessarily change too much when because we. We were programmed to survive and you only meet a minimum threshold to lose a, a trait in evolution. So if if you've got no reason to lose this self-interest, then it's still going to manifest, if you understand my kind of argument here. Yeah, I, I think I understand your argument, but also what I think Marx is saying is that if you remove scarcity, mm-hmm. um, you remove the reason why selfishness is displayed by people it might it might be still encoded in them somewhere mm-hmm. uh, for the for example when scarcity comes back then they become selfish again but when you remove scarcity they, they stop being selfish because there's no point isn't, isn't that if uh, maybe i'm understanding him wrong but but he i think that the the key thing here is that he believes that sc- scarcity and capitalism is the, the root of human selfishness so it's the the capitalist element as well that plays into it and although you could make a reasonable argument to say that if there was no scarcity, there would be no need to be selfish, there's also the argument that you have it programmed into your brain that you are to behave in a self-interested way. And unless there's some way of changing that, that's not going to change. Like <laughs> you've got, you've literally got to alter your brain to to get rid of this and. There's no reason to think that would be easy either because it seems to be something that's very core to at least mammals, I would say. <laughs> so it's it goes beyond human consciousness and although it might be possible to overcome it through rationality and being conscious, it's it's going to be something that would be very difficult and I don't know whether it's possible. Is, is it possible that selfishness is not displayed in people when they're not in a situation of scarcity, right? Is, is is that is that an option, right? That you still have it ingrained in your brain; it's still part of your nature, but it's it's not it's not manifested because you don't act on that kind of impulse if you're not in a situation of scarcity. Sure, um, I mean, you can the, the, consciously the, mitigate against your biological programming. I think that's mm-hmm. that's certainly something that's possible, but in, until we arrive at a point, it's difficult to say anything with certainty about you know a post-scarcity world yeah so i don't want to make any claims that aren't based on any evidence because we've we are yet to get that to that point yeah so it's better to have it grounded in our current situation and i don't think scarcity is going to go away anytime soon and in fact with a growing population it's probably going to be even more likely that people are going to compete for resources so so, um just just to make it clear what 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 marks what Marx thought would happen under communism uh, or after the, the socialist communist revolution mm-hmm. would be that that eventually society would uh, would arrive at a state where it would be stateless, classless, and and scarcityless. Yes, that, that's, exactly. That's the that's kind of vision of, of mm-hmm. communism. And so, um, of course, then then if you if you move that kind of vision to politics and and political systems then uh, that it becomes some, something completely different but like that's the, that's the kind of idea that that he was he was proposing that in this kind of world people would not be selfish anymore because it would there would no be there wouldn't be any scarcity so there wouldn't so, be any need for exactly, it yeah. exactly yeah and uh, i would also like to add the caveat that marx did not believe that capitalists are motivated by any essential kind of viciousness they simply had a drive towards what he considered the bare semblance of human existence so he believed that they were essentially satisfying base urges for resources, essentially. Right. So for money and power. Yeah, so he's not necessarily saying that 
they are particularly immoral, mm -hmm. but he's saying that they're they're not taking the the totality of the picture in his view, right? Which isn't necessarily an unreasonable position per se, um, and the reason he says it's a semblance of human existence is that he believes that capitalism alienates people from their true nature, as kind of alluded to just a second ago. So, so he thought he thought people's true nature was uh, something that would manifest itself in in communism, right? Yeah, and so, so and so the fact that uh, that you don't have communism means that you you what you're seeing people behave like and be like is not their true nature. Yeah, okay. it's a product of the economic system that okay. they lived under, yep. essentially. So um, I want to get on to why I don't necessarily think Marx is right. Um, and I want to start with the prisoner's dilemma, which I imagine you're relatively familiar with. I know what it is, yeah. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I've actually got it on screen here. Okay. So essentially, the two, it's like a hypothetical scenario, which it has been used in lots of... Uh, economic and psychological experiments, which looks at cooperation and essentially selfishness. Mm -hmm. And it has a kind of dilemma of two prisoners who have been caught and they either stay silent or cooperate with law enforcement. And then they either, ha they have these respective um, kind of sentences, I suppose. So if they both cooperate, they serve one year in prison which is the, the lowest kind of prison time. Um, if one uh, betrays, but the other doesn't, then one serves for three years, but one goes free. And if they both betray one another, they both serve two years. So there's kind of like a an intersecting model there where cooperation is the kind of the best for both, really, if you're kind of calculating it from the needs of, of both people. They would only serve one year each, which is the lowest amount of time. Um, however, it, it's, the research into this dilemma seems to suggest that cooperating isn't necessarily the most rational strategy because you, if you- At, at least not, not in, in a one-time event. Yeah, yeah. If, you've, if you've got continuous cooperation, then it makes sense because mm -hmm. you want to preserve that relationship. But if you, if you have no ties to this person, then it, it probably makes sense to betray them because they might be betray you and you might end up serving the three years in prison while they go free. Whereas if you betray them, at least you know you're going to get two years rather than three. three. Yep. So it, it always makes sense to betray the person in this scenario. And, and so, so it, if it if it moves to like a, a continuous kind of relationship mm -hmm. or repeated event where you can react to what has happened before and you can foresee that something else will happen in the future based on what you do now, then it makes sense. It makes sense. It made more sense to cooperate rather than to betray because then you need to foster that relationship. Yeah. And so then the optimal uh, optimal strategy would be to to always do what mm -hmm. what you saw the other guy do in the previous round, right? Sure. But the reason I have included this is because it provides a like a, a good example of how human nature could incentivize a lack of cooperation. Like because you can't guarantee the the good nature of the person you're cooperating with, it pays to have your own interests at heart. And I think that's the the core of why our evolution has programmed us to behave in this way. And this can be seen in something like uh, Richard Dawkins' Selfish Gene, where he talks about um, the gene from like evolution from the gene's point of view, all, all the gene wants to kind of anthropomorphize it is to spread more copies of itself. Right. So it, it's a means of explaining altruistic behavior because people who share your genes, it helps if you want to spread your genes further to promote their survival as well. Whereas people who have no shared genes, it makes sense not to cooperate with them from an evolutionary perspective. And I think that is the, the core of why something like this manifests in human behavior and why people might behave selfishly, if that makes sense. Yes, partly, but wouldn't, 
wouldn't the best scenario for genes preserving themselves and spreading themselves uh, be cooperation a lot of the time where you can foresee that cooperation will put you in a better position ultimately because you have have capacity to think sure. think about those situations th think about those out there's, outcomes it's it's not necessarily a, a binary thing of cooperate or be completely self interested there's a, a whole spectrum of cooperation and mm -hmm. i think it it pays for people to cooperate to a certain extent but where the cooperation puts you at risk perhaps disproportionately then it pays to have your own interests at heart um, according to this sort okay. of theory. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I want to move on to a little look at economics in primates, which sounds very counterintuitive, but my, my reason for including this is that because human beings are so complex and we have consciousness, we have elaborate societies, it's very difficult to establish what aspects of our personalities and our behavior are manifestations of our higher brain areas or our conscious minds essentially mm -hmm. and what parts are pre-programmed and biological so through looking at closely related primates it kind of helps to establish what traits we have and which we don't so that's the lobster view it is yeah <laughs> it's the the petersonian lobster view that um, lobsters' body language is altered by how successful they are in their conflicts, and therefore it influences their future success. Oh, I, I didn't know that 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 was that. That's what it what's, what it was about. Yeah, I, th I thought it was about them um, um, expressing male and female traits um, and kind of possessive traits and territorial traits as well that might be a part of it i'm probably just uh, no, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> brushing I'm sure, over it i'm sure you, you you know about much more about it than i do so that's, the, that's... the only thing i've actually heard about lobsters was in the uh, kathy newman interview with jordan right, peterson yeah. where he mentions it so that's i haven't actually looked at the research for myself but I, i've heard him talk about it so i might not be, be ac completely accurate there <laughs> as a caveat okay let's go to chimpanzees then. <laughs> okay so I, this comes from a research paper known as chimpanzee autarky and uh, an autarky is just an economy that occurs in isolation yep. i believe yep. and i'm just going to read out a quote from the research paper so although chimpanzees do engage in non-costly barter in which otherwise valueless tokens are exchanged for food this lack of risk is not typical of human barter Thus, we systematically explain barter in chimpanzees to ascertain w under what circumstances chimpanzees will engage in costly barter of commodities. That is, trading food items for other food items with a human experimenter. We found that chimpanzees do barter, relinquish lower value items to obtain higher value items, and not the reverse. So they've got some degree of understanding of value yep. there. And However, they do not trade in all beneficial situations, maintaining possession of less preferred items when the relative gains they stand to make are small. Okay. So what that seems to suggest is that there's some understanding of the risk of trade there. So, so that if you, if you might offer something to your partner, mm -hmm. um, trading partner, you they might betray you and you they might run away with, with yeah. your stuff. So chimpanzees don't really understand property rights. <laughs> which sounds ridiculous but it but it is true they they don't understand personal possessions so um if a chimpanzee was to offer something in trade chim another chimpanzee might just take it and run away right. and you know it's so, not like they have a moral compass to kind of feel guilty about it later so so because there there is always the risk they know that there there is this kind of risk yeah. so so if if the gain is small they won't in, engage in the trade yeah so this is like a small example of economizing primates essentially right. which seems to suggest uh, at least in my view that some degree of capitalism seems to emerge from our origin as primates and i'll i'll go on to elaborate on that a bit further so <laughs> there's a brilliant study which looks at capuchin monkeys which are small kind of simplistic monkeys that figured out how to use monetary tokens to uh, 
essentially prostitute themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they they didn't trade with food, but with yeah. actual tokens. So that didn't have value on mm -hmm. on their own. Just, they they only had exchange value and not mm -hmm. them. Kind of. This can actually be read about in quite an accessible New York Times article, which covers it um, rather than the actual research paper. But if you do want to look at more research on this, I recommend the research of Keith Chen, uh, who conducted this study, who's worked in behavioral economics with primates for quite right. a while. So essentially he says of capuchins, the capuchin has a small brain and it's pretty much focused on food and sex. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they, he says, you should really think of a capuchin as a bottomless stomach of want. <laughs> so this kind of gives you a picture that they, they are very focused on gaining resources, right. essentially. Yep. So in the experiment, which uh, Keith Chen did with Laurie Santos at Yale New Haven Hospital, um, they gave these kind of silver discs with holes in them. They were like to, they were meant to represent like coins, essentially. Okay. Yep. Um, but they were they had these weird holes in them. I don't know. I suppose that's just for the, the monkeys to be able to grasp them. Yep. I don't know the the rationale <laughs> behind it. But they had these little tokens which they taught them to exchange for food items. So these silver discs would be handed over to a human experimenter in exchange for apparently jelly cubes and grapes. And yep. they they established clear preferences for um, certain food items that were more desirable. So they figured, well, now we know that they can use these tokens in exchange for food. Why don't we manipulate the price right. of the food? Mm -hmm. So they increased and decreased the price of these certain food items. And they found that the um, monkeys essentially employed a utility maximization strategy in that they, they bought as much food when the price was low and they bought less when the price was high. Yeah, so, so they were able to wait or, or how long? Or? Um, they don't necessarily give a, a time frame, but they essentially proved that these monkeys had some theory of price because they reserved their mm -hmm. tokens for a time when they could make the most out of them right. as opposed yep, yep. to when the price was high. So they also um, kind of experimented with something known as loss aversion, which is something that was observed in human beings first. And essentially loss aversion is something where human beings seem to find losses as twice as bad as an equal gain. So losing two pounds is twice as bad as lo as gaining two pounds. And th the kind of rationale behind this is that in the kind of in environment in which primates have evolved, losing resources is far more dangerous for an organism's survival than gaining yeah, if if you get what I mean, uh, I think I do. So is is it is it something like that? If if you're if you're in like an adverse environment mm -hmm. and and you you've got you've got some limited resources, sure, um, the loss of a certain portion, small portion of the resources could be could be deadly to you, if mm -hmm. especially if if scarcity is is very severe around you in like mm -hmm. very, in less kind of wealthy conditions, less civilized conditions, let's say, then uh, even a small loss could result in, in catastrophic consequences. Yes. Whether, whereas a small gain is a gain that's nice, but is not as important, is not as consequential. And that's where this seems to originate from okay. um, and why you can prove mathematically that losses are perceived as twice as bad as the relative gains are. And they found this, which we thought was quite an elaborate, well, the, the scientific community thought initially that it was quite an elaborate human trait was actually found in capuchins, okay. which are relatively simplistic monkeys, essentially. So it it provides kind of a compelling argument for economizing man having more biological drives than you might initially think. Well, it kind of, kind of makes sense that loss aversion in particular would be something that you would observe with, with yeah. other other species as well especially because that kind of environment that kind of situation where the concept of loss aversion makes sense is is something that 
<laughs> humans might be actually less exposed to that situation just because they can through through that kind of reason yeah. through their long term planning they they can achieve a high level of wealth that where this well loss aversion is not as relevant anymore sure. as it as it is with with other species it's certainly not something unique to humans and it's certainly a concern that should be of to all animals essentially mm -hmm. so they they sent the experimenters essentially concluded that the data they had gathered from the observations of these capuchin monkeys made them statistically indistinguishable from most stock market investors <laughs> 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 which uh, i'm sure the people at wall street bets wholly approve of what does it mean then like what what did they what did they well, they're, they're essentially they saying that they're trying to maximize their gains, their reverse to losses in the same way and in and with the same mathematical patterns that we can observe in human behavior. So did they test like their you know, predicting power of like how, how successful they are at, at making gains or something like that as opposed to stock market investors? Or, <laughs> or, or, or I, I, didn't... I think it's simply comparable i think they're they're trying to make make it a bit i'm asking a bit like, of humor. Why, why did they make this the statement like what, what what was the point of comparison like the the same thing the same trends that manifest in human behavior can be observed in monkeys is the point they're trying to make okay. it's not necessarily that you're you're going to get loads of uh, capuchins working at hedge funds very soon the, the point is that that when i was uh, I, I i saw an article about a few months ago uh, maybe we'll be able to find it for the footnotes, but for for the show notes. But uh, in the article, you had researchers um, with some monkeys, mm -hmm. and they let the monkeys just like randomly press buttons on like some machines that would like buy and sell stocks, and they compared that to like, a performance of of a, a fund, some something <laughs> like that, right? And the performance was very comparable, so. <laughs> 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 That's like the, uh, the the thousand monkeys, thousand typewriters sort of analogy taken to real life. <laughs> yeah, so so that, that's that's what I thought this uh, this meant, or that this was a referring to, but maybe not. And I'll, I'll try to find that because that was really good. No, that's, that sounds like a good study actually. <laughs> so um, the the research goes on. The researcher goes on to say, sorry, that um, there were also some interesting observations that they didn't actually try and like test for if you will. So I'll read the following quote. The research assistant happened to slice cucumbers into discs instead of cubes, as was typical. One capuchin picked up a slice and started to eat it and then ran over to the researcher to see if he could buy something sweeter with it because the, the roundness of the, oh, yeah, the slice right, of cucumber yeah. looked like the token. So to the capuchin, a round slice of cucumber bore enough resemblance to Chen's silver tokens to seem like it was another piece of currency. So it shows that they understand roughly what these tokens come to represent and it seems to be that uh, some kind of aspect of the shape of it and the size seems to trigger something in their brain that that it's a store of value yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. so they also talk about an anecdote of uh, the, the first case of capuchin heist once a capuchin in the testing chamber picked up an entire tray of tokens, flung them into the main chamber, and then scurried in after them. It was a combination of a jailbreak and a bank heist, which led a chaotic scene in which the human researcher had to rush into the main chamber and offer food for bribes for the tokens. <laughs> um, and this, this seems to show that they understood that the value of these tokens was high enough that they would risk bad behavior right yeah and also yeah. the act of the experimenter having to bribe these monkeys to give the tokens back also reinforced further stealing as well <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's lots to unpack here and um it is also worth noting that in in this heist one of the the, the capuchins involved in the, the heist took the tokens and exchanged it to another monkey in exchange for sex which then the uh, the prostitute monkey then exchanged for a grape. <laughs> the oldest so, profession. <laughs> it truly is. So, Interesting. what this research seems to suggest is that not only can primates economize, they also have an ability to understand understand 
value in abstraction. Like these mm -hmm. these tokens didn't have any inherent worth right. to the right. to the capuchins, but they're able to exchange them for food, and therefore they became valuable in their mind. And so 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 even even then, if if the not the token itself, but the kind of roundness and the shape of the uh, of the token had this kind of value in their brain. Yeah, uh, they they then saw the cucumber, which they, I, I suppose, understand that they could eat it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they could understand that it has double value. It has value for them as, well, as food and as the exchange. What it shows is they, they tried to eat it first, realize, oh, this is a cucumber. I'd rather have a grape. Right. And then they're like, well, actually, it's a better value that I exchange this for something I want to eat. So that's that's quite a, like an elaborate thought process for a low world monkey, essentially. I'm not sure if that's the actual term for them, but that's what I'm calling them now. <laughs> so um, what you can kind of see here is that Marx's view that human selfishness arises from capitalism clearly isn't true, is it? Because <laughs> if even monkeys understand the, the utility in self-interest, then it suggests that it's not a, some, a product of consciousness and therefore it's not something that something as elaborate as an entire economic system can reinforce. It seems to have biological underpinnings as uh, opposed... Uh, this, this just means that you introduce capitalism to the capuchins. <laughs> <laughs> but if, the, if, <laughs> if even a capuchin can understand capitalism, then there's, there's got to be something there. <laughs> That, that shows it's inherent, right? <laughs> like, that's not unreasonable, is it? Capitalism is inherent to human nature. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's that's essentially what I'm arguing. Like, okay. it, it was the, uh, the oldest economic system. I mean, it's we've got evidence that it existed over 9,000 years ago from archaeology, that some of the earliest kind of documents of writing was to do with trades and stuff like that. So I think there's certainly a compelling argument to suggest that. But anyway, that's the end of part one and make sure to tune in tomorrow for part two where I talk about things like human motivation and Marx's view on that and why it's wrong and the individual in history and how Marx characterises history and also the limitations on individuals. Thank you right, and goodbye. <laughs>